Hello, wonderful person, this is Anton, and this here is Bill. Remember Bill? Well, let's hear what he has to say. It is well worth contemplating how we reach this moment of discovery. More than four billion years ago, this piece of rock was formed as a part of the original crust of Mars. After billions of years, it broke from the surface and began a 16 million year journey through space that would end here on Earth. It arrived in a meteor shower 13,000 years ago. And in 1984, an American scientist on an annual US government mission to search for meteors on Antarctica picked it up and took it to be studied. Today, Rock 84001 speaks to us across all those billions of years and millions of miles. It speaks of the possibility of life. Its implications are as far reaching and awe-inspiring as can be imagined. We will continue to listen closely to what it has to say as we continue the search for answers and for knowledge that is as old as humanity itself, but essential to our people's future. So back in the 90s, Bill Clinton made an announcement about this particular asteroid discovered in 1984 in Antarctica. This asteroid became really famous for one simple reason. This. It became famous for this. This kind of looks like a worm. And considering that this rock originally came from Mars and traveled in space for 16 million years and most likely landed on Earth approximately 13,000 years ago, this was a pretty big discovery. It suggested that maybe there was life on Mars, or at least there used to be life on Mars. And so in this video, Bill Clinton made this announcement. That's also around the same time when I became really interested in space sciences and at some point I ended up working as a research assistant for one of the scientists working with similar rocks. Specifically, he actually was trying to prove something else. He was trying to prove that this was not life. That all of this was just the result of a chemical reaction. There were several scientists doing that and eventually these scientists prevailed. They managed to recreate this as an actual chemical reaction, suggesting that none of this was life at all. It's what we would usually refer to as a false positive. It's morphologically similar to life, but it's never been made by life and it has nothing to do with a living organism. As a matter of fact, this particular formation was too small to be living to begin with. It was like nanometers in length, which was way, way smaller than the smallest bacteria on planet Earth. And so in the end, the announcement that you still can find on NASA's website, and it's also in the description below, was basically nothing. There was nothing to announce, there was nothing to discover. It was a chemical reaction that resembled life. Yet for years, the scientists believed that maybe we did find life on Mars after all. But because of how this meteorite was able to fool us, in the last few years a lot of scientists realized that we actually have to come up with a way to differentiate potential life from potential not life. In other words, we have to discover all of the possible natural ways that could somehow create organic looking structures without actually having anything to do with life whatsoever. And that's essentially where this paper comes in. And I personally think that's one of the more important papers when it comes to astrobiology. It's a way for us to prepare ourselves for a potential misidentification of future discoveries. Because a lot of scientists today believe that it's just a matter of time before one of the rovers on Mars discovers something that once again resembles life. Or possibly something that is life. But how do we tell them apart? And so that's what the scientists in this paper decided to do. They started a kind of a database for potential false positives when it comes to discovering extraterrestrial life. Be it biological life, be it some sort of other unusual life that we might discover one day. We have to know if it's truly life or if it's just a natural chemical reaction. And I think this image alone in this paper is a really good representation of why this is sort of important. For example, look at all of this random stuff. A lot of this sort of looks surprisingly lifelike. All of these unusual helix-like formations, all of these tubes, or even something like this that looks like a tiny garden or something that looks tubular in shape. All of these look surprisingly lifelike. But turns out none of them are. All of them were created in natural ways using various chemical reactions. For example, they refer to these formations as chemical gardens. So for example, this right here is a series of different tubes that seem to have emerged from different seed crystals. These are slightly different branching irregular curved tubes 
that also emerge from similar structures. Then there are some other formations, and this one is really interesting, that seem to have curved like a typical snail. Once again, very similar to formation. And then there is this tubular formation that's basically a combination of silicates and iron oxide. And because of their chemical nature, the scientists refer to these formations as chemical gardens. But none of them are produced by life. They're all just chemical in nature. So if one day we discover something on Mars that resembles this, we should be kind of cautious once again, because it's probably not created by anything living. Then they also identified another category they referred to as carbonate silicate biomorphs. That's the ones you see in these pictures right here. And so here it's basically a combination of silicates and different types of carbons, with some of them forming worm-like formations, with some of these worms being extremely lifelike in appearance, then also some unusual helical formations, and then some other things that seem to resemble mushrooms. And then there are some other formations that seem to be both helical, globular, and even produce sheet-like and dendrite-like formations that sort of resemble tiny plants. With a lot of this essentially being a result of what's known as the fractal growth. It's essentially when a chemical or any kind of a chemical structure starts to grow in a very predicted pattern, something that can easily be recreated using the right chemicals in the lab conditions. But personally, when I originally saw these images, I actually thought that these were some sort of microfossils, basically something that was produced by life. Which is once again a really important lesson. Morphology or appearance does not mean that it's something lifelike or has anything to do with life. But then they also classified the third type of different formations, something that sort of looks like this. They refer to these as carbon sulfur biomorphs. In other words, once again, here it's carbon, but this time mixed with sulfur instead of silicates. And sometimes they seem to form a complex network formed by filaments and spheres. Sometimes they form these shapes, often referred to as the rosettes. But sometimes they form these very unusual spherical empty shells that do create spheres that look very lifelike as well. But these usually represent just an early stage of formation in a typical carbon sulfur biomorph. So basically you can think of them as tiny bubbles. Here's actually, for example, what some of these bubbles might look like once they finish their formation. And I think these two last images are really interesting because first of all, this one shows us a combination of different spheres that seem to be interconnected in a similar way that we usually have cells interconnect in different complex organisms. And this here seems to be a very unusual helical filament that almost looks like a tiny, tiny plant, or possibly some sort of a DNA structure. Either way though, definitely very misleading. And then there are some other miscellaneous groups that haven't really found classification just yet. For example, this is a nanocrystalline structure and various mesocrystals, with this one here being particularly interesting. It seems to be some sort of a carbonate nanorod that was essentially produced at the surface of a carbonate silica biomorph. And this here seems to represent a nanocrystalline calcite sphere that precipitated in the presence of magnesium. So slightly different chemical reactions, but once again producing very lifelike shapes. Yet some other structures were also produced by mixing different living and non-living materials. So these spherical formations were actually formed by mixing RNA with quartz mixtures. And together they seem to have formed these unusual structures. This of course indicates that there might have been life present here, and then it ended up forming something that's not really related to life itself, but was still part of a chemical reaction. These two formations were created entirely by heating mixtures of actual amino acids. Not necessarily amino acids from life, but amino acids that can, in theory, produce life. In this case, they produce something that looks like life, but is not actually living at all. But I think the most interesting of these images is the one right here. This definitely resembles some sort of a life that's about to divide, or some kind of a double cell. But in reality, this is referred to as the fluoroapatite particle, and it seems to have precipitated in this shape if you put it in the presence of what's known as a citrate. Here's what fluoroapatite looks like in its natural form. It's a type of a phosphate mineral that's usually present in various igneous rocks. And if you put it in the citrate, it produces this on microscales. But that's of course just some of these discoveries and some of these false positives. Because this is a first such paper, the scientists here urge other scientists to try to create some kind of a catalog or some sort of a database 
to basically make this easily accessible in case we do discover something in the future that seems to resemble one of these shapes. But the main point here is that, well, first of all, it's somewhat difficult to conclude if something is living or not living. As a matter of fact, a lot of these formations are actually created inside rocks that might have had life in it as well. So it's a combination of possibly old living tissue or old living cells mixed with actual chemical reactions. In short, it's super complicated and requires a thorough analysis if we do discover something that resembles life in some of the Martian rocks. More importantly, just finding one sample would not be enough. Not only do you have to find several of similar looking samples, you also have to find other sources or other points of evidence to suggest that something is indeed life after all. But even here we have to be a little bit more cautious according to the scientists, because even here some of these false positives can actually produce somewhat similar chemical, molecular or some other unusual signs that seem to mimic life. And so the only way to avoid misidentification in the future is to create a database. A major database that presents all of these potential formations for various false positives for future discoveries of potential life. Which would be kind of similar to how we have a bunch of databases for discovering biosignatures. But all of this would have to start with, well, our presence on Mars. We would have to do a lot of field experiments, which obviously requires a manned mission to Mars sometimes in the next few years. But I guess until then, well, that's pretty much all I wanted to mention. It's a very important study, but it's not a particularly exciting topic, I guess, because here we're not discovering anything and we're not really finding anything new. As a matter of fact, we're sort of preventing a potential discovery. By presenting all of these false positives, this is maybe going to make a lot of future scientists a little bit upset. Mostly because they will think they have found something, but in reality, it's nothing at all. But I guess for now that's kind of all I wanted to mention. The paper, as always, is in the description below, and if you've enjoyed this video, check out some of the other Martian videos I made in the past, subscribe, maybe share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining a channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Either way, stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.